So I'd like to welcome Dr. Jonathan Birch, uh, today's speaker on Ento Live. Uh, sorry, not Dr. Professor Jonathan Birch, apologies. And he, he will be talking to us about invertebrate sentience. Uh, I'm not going to talk any more about that because I might as well let you get on and take us through the story of your research today. So over, over to you, Jonathan. Thanks very much, Kieran. And thanks for organising this really exciting series of webinars and for the energy and enthusiasm you're bringing to this. So if, from the moment we wake up every morning till the moment we fall into dreamless sleep at night, we're having this constant stream of subjective experiences. That's because we're sentient beings. You know, to be human is to be a certain kind of sentient being. Think about your own subjective experiences and the point of view they give you on the world and on your own body. Think of your visual point of view, what you're seeing in your, in your field of vision right now. But that's really just part of your subjective point of view right now. There's also all of your other senses, all of that auditory information coming in and that olfactory information, tactile, but also there's bodily feelings as well. You might be feeling a little bit hungry if you haven't had lunch, or you might be feeling satiated if, if you have had lunch. Your energy level might be high, your energy level might be relatively low, you might be feeling healthy, you might be feeling well. Our lives are full of these subjective feelings. I think we spend a lot of time wondering about each other's feelings. We might wonder, for example, if the quality of the experience you have when you look at a blue sky is the same as the experience I have, or is it Perhaps for you, it's more like looking at a sunset is for me. When we look at grass, do we all see the same quality when we have that experience of, of green? Or are we using the word green for quite different experiences in different people? And this is just in the human case. I think our imaginations leave us behind even more quickly when we try to imagine what it's like to be another animal. What is it like to be a bat echolocating? In fact, with, you know, there's a lot of debate about which other animals have subjective experiences at all. Is it just a human thing? Is it just something we share with other primates or other mammals? Or is it shared much more widely than that? I think, you know, quite an important moment in, in motivating my research project was this moment in 2012 when a whole bunch of eminent neuroscientists got together in Cambridge and signed up to what they called the Cambridge Declaration on Consciousness. There was basically this attempt to create a declaration that signals, let's start trying to study the subjective conscious experiences of other animals scientifically. Let's not write it off as a question we'll just never know the answers to, but let's actually try and use the methods we've developed in the human case through studying the human brain and apply it to other animals to try and understand their subjective feelings as well and they wrote non-human animals including all mammals and birds and many other creatures including octopuses possess neurological substrates complex enough to support conscious experiences where by conscious experiences they didn't mean anything too sophisticated in terms of intelligence it doesn't necessarily require the ability to understand yourself as a conscious being or the ability to understand the feelings of others but just to have those experiences to have experiences that feel like something from the animal's point of view. An idea that in, in philosophy is sometimes called the idea of phenomenal consciousness. I think 11 years later, after that Cambridge Declaration, a field really is emerging. A field of animal sentience research or animal consciousness research. A field that draws on a very wide range of disciplines, including neuroscience, comparative psychology, animal welfare science, my own discipline of philosophy, evolutionary biology, also social sciences like economics and law. It's a field that is starting to get a visible presence, as you can see from the journal Animal Sentience, for example, that was founded in 2016. Everything that's published in that journal is open access, so it's actually a fantastic resource for getting a sense of the state of the art in animal sentience research. It's a field that faces some foundational challenges as well. If you think of what is required in practice to try and get people from all of these disciplines working together around a shared research agenda, there can be some problems. 
And it's been a, a real pleasure since 2020 to be running a project that is trying to put this emerging field on solid methodological and conceptual foundations. It's called the Foundations of Animal Sentience Project. It's based at the LSE. Uh, I'm the principal investigator on it, but we have a whole team of people, including postdocs, PhD students. And our goals are better methods for studying the conscious experiences of animals scientifically, and at the same time, new ways of using that science to design better policies, laws, and ways of caring for animals. There's a link to our website there. Now in Zoom, you can't click on any of these links that are appearing in, in the slides. But if you want to bring up the slides in a browser window, just go to bit.ly slash birchentolive, and that should bring up the slides in a way in which you can actually click on the, the links. So we've been doing lots of things on this project give a brief overview and then I'll zoom in on one specific thing and on this topic for today of invertebrate sentience. Part of it is about conceptual work. For example, how do we compare the conscious experiences of different animals when we find it so hard to compare even our own experiences as, as humans? Does it make sense, for example, to have a single sliding scale on which some animals are more or less conscious? where, for example, a, a chimpanzee might be rated as being more conscious than a shrimp or something like that. We argue in this paper, Dimensions of Animal Consciousness, that that really doesn't make sense and that it should not be an aim of this field to try and construct a single sliding scale that rates some animals as more conscious and others as less conscious. Rather, we need to be thinking of it more like this, that any, any sentient being has its own conscious experiences with their own particular structure and particular content. And there's really lots of different dimensions along which those experiences might vary. And what we need to try and do is understand the structure of that variation. In other words, try to understand the sentience profile or cognitive profile of different species along multiple different dimensions of variation. And in this paper, we, we set out some proposals about what we think the main dimensions of variation where comparison is possible might be. You know, things, for example, like how, how rich are the animal's experiences of the past, how rich are its plans for the future, and so on. So that's the conceptual side of the project. There's also been a, a sort of field building side where we've been trying to bring lots of people together from across disciplines. We produced this special issue of the Journal of Consciousness Studies on Animal Consciousness where uh, to open the issue, we asked all of the contributors to just answer the question, how should we study animal consciousness scientifically in 500 words or fewer? If you want to see the answers they came up with, there's a link there to that. So there's the conceptual side, the field building side, and also a policy facing side as well, which I'll come back to later. We've been I mean, to me, surprisingly influential in that I never expected the project to have the, the influence that it's had. But we produced a report in 2021 that I'll talk about in a moment that led to some invertebrates, particularly lobsters, crabs, octopuses, and other cephalopods and decapods being recognized in UK law as, as sentient beings. A very important idea for me in thinking about these issues and about the ethical and policy side of animal sentience is the precautionary principle, the idea that we should try to err on the side of caution in some sense, when we're unsure about whether an animal is, is sentient or not. And then as well as the conceptual field building, policy facing aspects of our work, um, well, there's more, I'll come on to what, what there's the empirical side too, including some new results about insects, which I'll come back to at, at the end. But for this talk, I want to zoom in on the, the report we produced and talk a bit about the framework we used for addressing questions of sentience in invertebrates, a bit about our major findings and the recommendations that resulted from them. And then, uh, you know, because this is Ento Live and because the report we did was focused on octopuses, crabs, lobsters, um, I want to talk in the last part of the talk about the work we've been doing more recently that specifically concerns insects. So in our report, we had this problem of how to define sentience in a way that was appropriately precise to guide our inquiry, but not so constraining that it limited it by definition to just vertebrates. 
And so we defined it like this. We said sentience is the capacity to have feelings such as feelings of pain, pleasure, hunger, thirst, warmth, joy, comfort, excitement. It's not simply the capacity to feel pain, but feelings of pain, distress or harm have a special significance for animal welfare law. In the end, a lot of the evidence we were reviewing in this report was in fact quite closely related to pain because pain is the particular aspect of sentience that people have worried about the most in invertebrates and, and studied the most. But I think it's important to emphasize that sentience is not just pain. You know, sentience is, is the whole of our subjective experiences of all different kinds, including the positive side of mental life, you know, pleasure, joy, excitement, as well as the negative side. But in practice, most of the evidence has concerned the negative side. The scope of the report was quite limited and it was deliberately limited by DEFRA. They just commissioned us to review the evidence of sentience in two specific taxa, the cephalopod or, or cephalopod mollusks, which includes octopuses, squid, cuttlefish, also nautiloids as well, which are very under-researched, and the decapod crustaceans. So not all crustaceans, um, but a uh, you know, an order of relatively large crustaceans involving around 15,000 different species, including the true crabs, lobsters, crayfish, and shrimps. So even within these two invertebrate taxa, there's a lot of variation. We had to try and somehow make sense of that variation in our, in our report. There was a significant challenge. We came up with this framework that focused on eight indicators where we thought there's a, firstly, there's evidence here to review. You know, people have, have looked for these things to some extent, and they're also relevant to questions of sentience. They have the potential to lower or raise the probability that these animals are feeling things, and in particular, that they're feeling pain. I think one of the, the crucial challenges in this area is to distinguish a feeling like pain from what's called nociception, which is just the detection of noxious stimuli. So if you think of uh, you, when you touch a hot stove and your hand recoils, it's a reflex response that, as far as we know, does not involve the conscious experience of pain at all. Now, of course, pain follows. It does hurt, but it hurts afterwards. Your, your hand is already in the process of recoiling before you're feeling the pain. And so the pain is not involved in producing that sort of behavior. It's just a reflex. And so some people, when they're looking at invertebrates, uh, like octopuses, crabs, lobsters, insects, and so on, they say, oh, everything, all their reactions to stimuli are just, they're just like our reflexes. They don't involve any conscious element. And so we were looking for lines of evidence that could potentially challenge this. Now, it's very hard to achieve sort of certainty in this area, but we do think there are lots of lines of evidence that can change probabilities and make this more or less likely. In particular, what we were interested in looking for were, were signs of behavior and cognitive ability that certainly go beyond mere reflexes and that have to involve centralized integration of information by the brain and that tie in with plausible theories of what it is that our conscious feelings do for us. For example, we were very interested in certain forms of learning, because if you think of that situation where you touch uh, the hot stove, um, now that the, the pain, the pain you feel does not produce the reflex withdrawal, but it does help you learn. And in particular, it helps you learn not to do that again helps you learn not to put your hand uh, on a hot stove to avoid that general kind of situation. And so it's very plausible that pain experience, although it's not guiding immediate reflexes in us, does have functions relating to learning and memory and flexible decision making. And so what we were looking for in uh, invertebrates was evidence of behaviors like this that also involve similar kinds of integration, learning, memory flexible decision-making. Uh, now, none of the criteria we, we came up with is intended as a sort of smoking gun that just proves the animal is sentient straight away. It's never really going to work like that uh, in this area. Um, and also, we're not looking for things here that could never exist without sentience. And I think 
you know, our first criterion in particular is just possession of nociceptors, which is nervous cells that are specialized to respond to noxious stimuli. It's um, entirely possible that some animals that are not sentient still have nociceptors. So we're not looking for, it's not as though each one of these is a, is a proof by itself, but it's a list of criteria that are like symptoms. And just how if you're trying to diagnose a disease, a lot of the time you're not looking for immediate conclusive proof, but rather for lots of symptoms that can raise the probability of having that disease. What we're trying to do is come up with symptoms of sentience that we could look for in invertebrates. And so we reviewed all the literature that existed for our, our taxa, the, the cephalopods and the decapods, for all of these eight criteria to see what evidence we could find. And in the end, we ended, we found uh, over 300 scientific studies and our final report to DEFRA ran to over a hundred pages. It ended up a lot longer actually than we thought it was going to be because we found so much relevant evidence. The key finding I would say is that in all of the invertebrate groups we considered in that report, the balance of evidence tilts towards sentience in that the sort of things we were finding were not showing these criteria to be failed, but rather showing at least some of them to be satisfied. Now, the evidence ended up varying a lot you know, from one group of animals to the next, as, as we would have expected at the beginning. In octopuses, the evidence really was very strong. And I'll give some examples in a moment. By the way, it's always a fun, uh, topic of conversation, isn't it? The plural of octopus. And uh, in our report, we used octopods to emphasize that we're talking about all the species of the genus Octopoda. Uh, we're trying to counter the false assumption people sometimes make um, that there's only one octopus species. In fact, there's, there's at least 300 octopus species. So collectively, we called them octopods. The evidence there really was very strong. Among the decapod crustaceans were well, not as strong, but a su substantial amount of experimental work, particularly focusing on crabs, true crabs of the infraorder brachiura. And we found substantial evidence in other uh, cephalopods, the so-called colloid cephalopods, including cuttlefish, squid, as well as in hermit crabs and lobsters and crayfish. The slides have, have the summary tables from our report. And of course, you're not going to just memorize those from seeing them on a slide. But if you want to bring up the slides in your own uh, time, remember it's bit.ly slash birch ento live. But the table gives you an at a glance picture of what we found that the octopuses were really, uh, you know, there was substantial evidence there for all of the eight criteria we were looking at. All of those eight criteria that show that what's going on is beyond mere reflexes. And uh, in these other cases, well, there was less evidence, but all the evidence we found was pointing in the same direction. With the nautiloids, hardly anything. Um, but that's not because people have looked for sentience in nautiloids and found it not to be there, but rather that people haven't looked. Uh, there's almost a total evidence of ab absence of evidence for the nautiloids. And then in the decapod crustaceans, again, it's this complex, quite messy summary table showing the overall picture but one that gives you a you know an at a glance sense of how the evidence is a bit stronger in the true crabs, and there's this you know there's very significant evidence gaps regarding the pinnated shrimps that are sold commercially as king prawns, where it's a bit like the situation with the nautiloids, where it's not that there's lots of evidence that they're not sentient, but rather hardly anyone has looked. There's hardly any experimental work. There's not a lot of evidence there. But in contrast to nautiloids, they're incredibly commercially important. And so it's a bit of a scandal, really, that people have been farming these animals for decades without really asking the question of whether they're sentient or not. So we, we reviewed over 300 studies. We produced this complicated picture where, um, you know, the greens represent high or very high confidence. These things are present. The owls rep and yellows represent low confidence. And we had the problem of, uh, of what to do with this overall picture. I mean, before explaining how we came to recommendations based on all of this, so first of all, just give a few examples of the types of study we were reviewing in this report. And I guess that the types of study that, that stick in my memory as being particularly memorable for, for what they showed about these animals. 
The first example concerns uh, octopuses. It's a paper by Robin Crook from 2021, published in the journal iScience, where if you think back to that example of touching a hand on a hot stove and, you know, what maybe it tells us about the functions of pain in us and this idea that pain doesn't guide your reflexes, but it does help you to learn. Um, it's led in mammals to the development of this quite standard way of testing for pain called the condition place preference test, where you give an animal a choice of three different chambers. You see which chamber it prefers normally. And then you see what happens when it comes to link one of those chambers with an injury or noxious stimulus of some kind. And then it it learns to, to link another one of the chambers with the experience of, of pain relief, uh, like access to a, a painkiller. And you see whether its preferences change so that it comes to prefer the chamber where it can access the pain relief and disprefer the one where it experienced an injury, even if it previously preferred the one where it got injured. And when a when a mammal displays this behavior, people take it as evidence of, of pain in that mammal, because that's that's the way we'd interpret it in the human case. If you think, why would I come to prefer a chamber where I could access pain relief? Well, it's because it works as pain relief. You know, it's because I was feeling pain and going to that chamber uh, helps me get relief from it. And so Robin Crook used the same standard type of experiment with octopuses and got the same result where the noxious stimulus was an injection of acetic acid in the arm. Now these experiments, so they involve doing unpleasant things for, to octopuses, but I mean, in my view, the, the justification is relatively clear because the potential benefits of understanding that uh, octopuses are sentient beings and protecting them in law are very great. So Crook administered this noxious stimulus and looked at how it affected the preferences of the octopus for different chambers and found that the octopus came to very strongly prefer the chamber where it could access a local anaesthetic. In particular, uh, lidocaine was the local anaesthetic, where it could experience the effects of lidocaine on its injured arm. And moreover, Crook also observed that the octopus would display directed grooming behavior. So the arm that had been injured, it would start to uh, attend to it, groom it, it would also do a, a skin scraping behavior, which possibly evolved to um, sort of remove noxious compounds that are on the skin in the, in the wild, it's trying to scrape off the stimulus, as well as hiding the affected arm. And Crook even did uh, neurophysiological recordings of the nervous system activity, showing that when the animal was injured, but had not received any local anesthetic, there was this storm of activity in the connectives between the arms and the brain that was then silenced once it got access to the local anesthetic. So you put all that together and you have this pattern of behavior that really in any other animal you see the, the best explanation for that behavior is that the animal is feeling pain. And Crook argues that's exactly what we should say about the octopus as well. I think that's entirely uh, reasonable. I'll just give a couple of other examples as well. It was this study, this is moving now to the decapod crustaceans or the noctopuses. It's a study from Fossas et al. In, in science where they let crayfish explore a light maze. So it's got some dark arms and some light arms and it's free to explore. And then they, they track its movements around the maze. And normally the crayfish explore all of the arms of the maze, but then they give them a stressful experience in the form of an electric shock and show that the behavior is changed. So there's this behavior change where they no longer will explore the light arms. They, they just stick to the dark arms, just as we would um, when stressed or anxious. And then, you know, that's unsurprising, I suppose. But then the really striking bit that really stuck in my mind was that when they administered to the crayfish an anti-anxiety drug developed for use in humans, they found it restored the original behavior. 
that the crayfish were then willing to explore the light arms of the maze again. And if you, again, if you think about it, if you, if you saw that behavior in a human, you'd think, well, why did we see that pattern of behavior? Well, it was because there was a feeling of anxiety that the drug ameliorated. Now, no one would, would take that as being conclusive proof that the crayfish also are feeling anxiety. But it suggests there's more going on here than just reflex responses. It suggests there's really something interesting that Foss et al. describe in their paper as an anxiety-like state. And I'll give a third example as well, which concerns crabs, and is from the work of Bob Elwood um, and collaborators at Belfast, where, again, if you return to you know, our, what pain does for us in our own lives, One of the things it quite clearly does for us, I think, is help us make decisions. And in particular, this, the severity of the pain is very important for that. That we have various grades of pain. And so if you're, if you're running, for example, and you, you feel a very, a very light pain, like a very, you know, you hardly notice it, you might well keep running through that and keep going because you've got more important priorities. But then if the pain gets very severe, if it's something like the pain of a broken leg or a twisted ankle, it crosses a threshold where now you have to stop. Right? Now you have to stop what you're doing because your priority has changed. Your priority is now to alleviate the pain. And so one possibility for what pain does for animals that feel it is help them make flexible decisions by prioritizing different needs. And Elwood wanted to test whether in hermit crabs, there is a similar centralized prioritization process. And so he developed this experiment where it exploits the fact that the crabs have very clear preferences for different types of shell. And so in the wild, they will leave a, a, a low quality shell for a high quality shell. Um, and he wanted to see, well, if you give them a high quality shell, but there's also a downside because they're also going to receive electric shocks when they're in that shell. Uh, how will how will they make decisions? And is there is there a, a sort of voltage of shock at which they'll give up their shell, even though it's of great value to them? And does the amount of electric shock they're willing to withstand depend on the quality of the shell? And in this 2009 paper, he provided results that suggest it does you know that the amount of electric shock the crab is willing to withstand before it leaves the shell depends on the quality of that shell. So it's quite sophisticated decision making and it's using you know, putatively using pain in, in the same way that we do, using it to make decisions about whether you need to stop doing something or leave something, leave a situation, even though it's otherwise uh, valuable to you. So we looked at all these, you know, this is three examples of the studies that go into these huge tables. And as I say, there's over 300 studies going into the, the tables overall, and this is just three of them. We you know, had this picture with really quite a lot of evidence um, and all of that evidence tilting towards sentience in the taxa we considered, but much stronger in some taxa than others. And we needed to come to a recommendation to the UK government in the end, we thought, no, there's no, there's no other recommendation we can make but this one, that, that all cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans should be regarded as sentient animals for the purposes of UK animal welfare law. They should be regarded as animals for the purposes of the Animal Welfare Act and in any future legislation relating to animal sentience. Now, I mean, hearteningly, one of our recommendations was implemented. The government... Um, implemented that key recommendation that its new Animal Welfare Sentience Act that was passed last year should not just extend to vertebrates. So they drafted a version that only included vertebrates. We recommended it should be extended and they amended it to add cephalopods and decapods to its scope. Now since then, um, what we've not seen is our other, other recommendations being implemented. So we think you no, know, really all animal welfare law should include these animals. And so the Animal Welfare Act, the Animal Scientific Procedures Act, the regulations concerning humane slaughter and, and so on, should all include these animals. And they could all be amended quite easily 
to do so. So some unfinished business here because we haven't yet seen those other pieces of legislation being amended. But still, I mean, getting that explicit protection in law for cephalopod mollusks and decapod crustaceans, for the first time, you know, for the decapods, the cephalopods had been protected, but only in science. So only inside uh, you know, scientific laboratories, not outside. Getting that protection written into law was certainly an important positive step, I think, for taking these animals more seriously as sentient beings. Since then, we've been asking, well, how widely might sent sentience be spread in the animal kingdom? We were asked to focus on cephalopods and decapods in this report because they've often been considered the best candidates and you know, the most likely candidates. But as soon as you start recognizing that these animals are sentient beings, I think you quickly start thinking about other invertebrates as well. I think in particular, your thoughts turn immediately to insects that like the decapods are also arthropods and they're also quite you know, cognitively sophisticated in some ways often quite intelligent arthropods and so more recently we've been looking you know is are those indicators those signs of sentience that people have found in crabs lobsters octopuses are they also there in insects because again you've got this problem where no one's really looked properly and they should with insects people will often i suppose dismiss the idea that they feel pain uh, there's a long history of people just dismissing this idea and reporting anecdotal observations about how insects will carry on feeding or mating despite catastrophic injury so you know stories about how if you cut their abdomen off they just carry on feeding and the you know, the sugar solution just drips out the back of the of the thorax. But I think it's important to see that, I mean, they don't have to feel pain in the same circumstances we would to feel pain at all. And they don't have to actually feel pain at all to still be sentient in other important ways. And in particular, I think we need to, you know, not necessarily obsess about their responses to catastrophic injury to the integument but think about things like their responses to heat and you no know, not just stimuli that they can detect at the antenna uh, so that's what we've been doing in recent work particularly the work of uh, Tilda Gibbons a PhD student at Queen Mary and my postdoc on the project Andrew Crump on the experimental side of the project we've been collaborating a great deal with with Lars Chitka's lab at Queen Mary in London and we basically found a way of reproducing that experiment from Elwood and, and his crabs, but with bees, where if you remember the hermit crabs were, were you know, the question was, do they trade off the value of a shell against the voltage of the electric shock they receive in it? The question with the bees was, do they trade off the sweetness of a sugar solution against the temperature they can the temperature of a heat pad they have to stand on in order to access it. So we were trying to make the, you now there's a noxious stimulus here, which is the heat of the heat pad underneath the bee. We were trying to make it as, uh, you know, to find a stimulus that was as mild as we could realistically do. So not extreme heat, but um, sort of 40 degree heat. And then find out whether it makes these trade-offs between you know will it is it more willing to stand on the heat pad if there's a sweeter reward on offer just as we would be more willing to withstand an unpleasant experience like having a hand in an ice bath or something like that to get a bigger reward at the end of it and the result from the, you know as published in um proceedings of the national academy of sciences usa last year was that they do make these trade-offs um just as we would in a similar situation. And Tilda also has been looking at the question of, uh, you know, do they do directed grooming like the octopuses? And finding that they do, you know, that if one antenna is injured, they will selectively groom that antenna. So that the picture is, uh, you know, we think, starting to 
change. And change in a way that really makes it quite plausible that insects do feel pain. We've done this large review actually that was applying the same principles that we applied to our review of the decapods and, and cephalopods, but this time looking at the insect evidence. Um, it's not yet available open access, but if you email me, I can, can send it to you. There's also a link here to an accessible summary of what our review showed. So it's, it's, it's again a complicated, messy picture where you're constantly faced with these evidence gaps because hardly any species have been studied. And some of the most commercially important species of insect have hardly been studied. Um, in fact, a large amount of the evidence comes from bees, first of all, and fruit flies, Drosophila fruit flies. But in those cases where people have looked for evidence of you know, something like pain, it seems like the signs, are, the signs are there. It's not going to be like our pain. It's probably quite different in lots of ways. But the sign, you know, what they respond to noxious stimulation in ways that goes beyond a reflex, that seems increasingly clear. So there's then a sort of question about what to do about this. It's, you know, we're talking here about an expansion of the number of animals recognized as sentient by you know, at least a factor of 20. Uh, the number of insects in the world is absolutely mind blowing. We, what we want to do is start a conversation about what might be proportionate to welfare risks in relation to insects. There are obviously going to be limits and we can't just, you know, I mean, crop farming kills a lot of insects. You can't just ban, ban crop farming. But you could ask questions about pesticides, for example. There's a lot of controversy regarding pesticides already and uh, you know, some of them potentially being linked to colony collapse and the collapse of wild bee populations. That's an ecological reason to worry about pesticides. But if we also think insects have a capacity for suffering, there might also be a, a welfare related reason too, you know, a second reason to ask that question of what are the alternatives. We've also been trying to start a conversation within science because within science, insects are generally regarded as non sentient and you, you can do whatever you want to them. And we've been asking, is it time for insect researchers to consider their subjects welfare? And we think it is, at least on a precautionary basis, on, a, on an erring on the side of caution basis. And in fact, we've been involved, along with, with Megan Barrett, who's, who's taken the lead on this, in helping to set up an insect welfare research society that just aims to try and, you know, first of all, get more evidence on these questions so we can fill in some of these huge evidence gaps but also encourage precautionary thinking and a precautionary attitude and encourage people who are working with insects in their day-to-day -day lives to start taking seriously the idea that they might be sentient beings and just doing common sense things um, to protect their welfare, like making sure they're always well fed and things like that. There's a lot of small steps we can take without radically changing our lives. So I'll, I'll leave it there. And if you want to bring up the whole report we did on cephalopods and decapods, there's some links on the slides. And if you want to bring up these slides, it's bit.ly slash birch live. Thanks very much.